So I don't dream. If I do, I never remember them. They say you dream every night. I have no idea. I probably remember a handful of dreams that I've ever had. Um, but a few days ago, I had a dream. And I had a dream in, that I was living back at my parents' house. Now, I haven't lived at my parents' house for over 36 years. But I was living at my parents' house. And in that dream, it was almost as if I had gone back to when I was first born again. And I saw things happening in my home that God was bringing to my attention supernaturally. So in other words, I'd be standing in my bedroom, my old bedroom, and a paper would come out of nowhere in my room and would come to me. And what this paper was, it was things that God wanted me to uh, get rid of and get ready for. Uh, and so I'm like, yeah. And so then all of a sudden, I was lifted out of my ability and capability, and I was actually transported, like hovering, into the kitchen where my mother was. Now, my mother's been gone 13 years this year, and she was alive and well in this dream. And I was transported to where she was. And, you know, I didn't know what the dream meant at first, but all of a sudden, God began to show me how in the dream, ladies and gentlemen, if you've got stuff in your house that don't belong, do a house cleaning, because I think Jesus is coming soon. The other thing that I felt like God was showing me in this dream is this. When we think and we have this idea that we're in control, give it up. Because whatever control you think you have is going to come to an end. Because I think we have some spiritual warfare that's going to hit us like we've never seen. Some of you are saying, Pastor, how can you say that? Oh my goodness. Have you not been awake these last two, three, four years? All the changes that have come and all the aggression against the Christian church and Christians. Folks, if you're not praying people, you're not prone to pray, I would suggest you start today. If you're not prone to reading your Bible, I suggest you start digging in today. Amen? Hallelujah? Hallelujah? Because here's the deal. You can only kick God out of a nation so long and his blessings flow with him. This is why we're starting to see chaos take place where people don't even know the right hand from the left hand. I'm telling you, there's stuff coming. I don't know what it is, but that dream shattered me. One of the things that uh, God put in my mind as I woke up was, y'all remember the story of Samson and Delilah? See, we always remember Samson, strong guy, and, you know, he can do this, that, and the other thing. But, you know, even as strong as he was, he willingly laid his, hat, la his head in the lap of the enemy. And he didn't even know that was the enemy. He was overtaken by her beauty. He fell in love with something that he shouldn't have fallen in love with, and he laid his head in the lap of the enemy. And then you know the story. He got his hair cut. And the problem is, is that when he awoke from her lap, he didn't even know that the Spirit of God had departed from him. Can I tell you that I believe we're living in a day we do not even know if the Spirit of God is with us or has departed in some places. Why? Because I think we've lie, laid our head in the lap of Delilah. We have fallen in love with the world. I am going to be going through, probably after this, because this is going to lead us right into this, what Jesus said is going to happen in the end times. And if you haven't been reading about the end times, I suggest you start. If you want to follow us on Facebook as I go through this, this is great. Am I going to be right completely? No, of course not. I'm telling you that right now. There's a whole lot that, but I'm going to be right on a few things. Probably most things, I hope. But I know this. We don't know the day or the hour. But we have never seen what we have seen in the world. It has never happened this way. Do you know that the only time that had, there has been a worldwide anything like this pandemic was the flood? And the flood wiped out everybody except for eight people. We have never seen a pandemic in all of history that I can see that has stopped the world. We have never seen that. And what does the Bible say? Jesus said, in the last days, there will be famines. There will be pestilence. There will be et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if I had Dan's trumpet right now, 
it wouldn't help me anyway, but if I knew how to blow his trumpet and make it blast, I would use that as an alarm. It's time the church gets shaken up to its knees. Yeah. Amen? Amen? We need to start praying like we're living in the end times. Famine in the land, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you that as we've been going through Genesis, you have brought me to places and things that I didn't plan on preaching in the timing that it was time to preach. And I love that. Because, Lord, nobody can say of me that I was picking on anybody because I, I wasn't. At least I don't feel like I was. i got a clear conscience. But, Lord, I pray that you'd help me to say the things you want me to say, refrain from the things you want me to refrain. But, Holy Spirit, I pray for a most powerful move today. I pray that hearts would be absolutely convinced, convinced of some of the things we're going to talk about today. And then motivated and encouraged. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in the part in Genesis where there's a famine in the land. Oops. Help if I turn it on. <laughs> Uh-oh. Did I go the wrong way? Hmm. There we go. I hate technology. <laughs> a severe famine. For those of you that have never, it's been a while since you've read through the famine uh, that Joseph uh, experienced, proclaimed from Pharaoh's dream. God prepared Pharaoh. He prepared uh, Canaan, obviously. Canaan came to Egypt. Egypt is having a severe famine. We're going to walk through this a little slow, and then we're also going to make parallels to the day in which we're living in. Genesis, beginning at verse 13 in chapter 47, says, Now there was no food in all the land, because the famine was very severe. Everybody say, very severe. So that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered all the money that was found in the land of Egypt. Say, all the money. In the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. There's no food, there's no money. Let's talk about very severe, let's talk about languished. That's in particular, that's important in particular. So severe in the Hebrew, it means heavy in figurative language. Severe, difficult, heavy laden. You remember Jesus said, come unto me all of you who are heavy laden, for you'll find rest for your souls. These people were heavy laden. Now, I'm going to put this disclaimer out. It is impossible for me to communicate anything to you to declare in depth and in at, at the best of my, our ability experientially to tell you how this is. In other words, we've never experienced the severity of what they're experiencing, so it's almost impossible, save the Holy Spirit, for me to communicate the severity of this famine. We have never experienced this in our culture, in our lifetime, in my parents' lifetime, in my great-parents' lifetime great-grandparents' lifetime. The depression of the 1920s was bliss in comparison to what the Bible is talking about here in the land of Canaan and in the land of Egypt. It was so severe. They had no food and they had no money. They could not even raise food because they were agriculturalists back then, so they were gardeners. They knew how to raise food, but they couldn't do it. The land rejected everything they plant. It was that severe. And they're word exhaustion, which is also languish, uh, it means from the exhaustion of frenzy to languish. Have you guys ever been so exhausted that you were in a frenzy? Hmm. Let's look at the uh, Webster's Dictionary of languish. The root word is languid. Feeble. Exhausted spiritless, to lose strength and animation, to pine away. Picture this for a moment. At least two nations, the nation of Egypt, the nation of Canaan, or three, if you call it the nation of Israel, but there were only 70 at that time. It was so bad, 
Not only could they not plant, because if they did, the soil would just reject what they planted. They couldn't survive off that. Not only that, but listen, it was so bad, they had no money. If you think you don't have money now, even two bucks in your pocket is more money than they had in any savings that they had. It was all gone. They had to have their money spent to pay for food so that they could eat and live and their animals could eat and live. Because back then, animals were much more important to them than they are to us. See, animals to us are friendly little pet things. But they needed animals for so many things. They needed horses and oxen to plow their land. They needed the animals. They couldn't just kill off their oxen and kill off their horses because they needed them for planting. They couldn't use them for food. If they did, then they couldn't plant well or they couldn't plant enough. So their animals were like farm tractors at the Bundys and at the Townsend's place. That's how important those animals were. They couldn't just kill them. But they had to have them. Now when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food, for why should we die in your presence? Our money is gone. Then Joseph said, Give up your livestock, and I will give you food for your livestock, since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses and the flocks and the herds and the donkeys, and he fed them with food in exchange for all their livestock that year. Now think about this for a moment. They just took all the tractors from the Bundys and the Townsends. They don't have a single thing left. Everything and anything that they used to do the work that they need to do on the farm is now gone. Because they had to eat. They were dying. They had to eat. They were so in utter straits. And by the way... That's also including uh, the people of Israel because when you zoom 400 years when Egypt began to give them a hard time, they didn't have anything until they left. And then they were blessed. When that year was ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money's all spent, the cattle are my Lord's. There is nothing left for my Lord except our bodies and our lands. That's why I said you and I have never experienced anything like this ever. Not even our parents, not even in the Great Depression. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we and our land will be slaves to Pharaoh. So give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. Now I want to stop here for a moment. Do you remember back when the children of Israel got a chance to have Joseph revealed to them? Do you remember what Joseph said about the Egyptians and them? How the Egyptians loved them because they were shepherds. Well, what do you think Joseph was before he got brought into Potiphar's house and then thrown in jail? And he was a shepherd. Think about this for just a moment. Their their depravity, their frustration, their severity was so bad that they were willing to beg to someone that was considered loathsome so they could eat. Think about that for a moment. Give us seed that we may live and not die and that the land may not be desolate. I think it's in Ireland. I could be wrong. I'm willing to be wrong. I'm going to say something that has hit the political realm that is more of a spiritual thing, but I'm going to bring it out, and they may consider it political. And if you do, please deal with it. I'm not going political, but I think it needs to be said. In the Green New Deal, the Green, in Ireland, I believe, They're going to farmers with multitudes of cattle and they're telling them to kill off some of their cattle because of greenhouse gases. How stupid. How ungodly. 
God said, be fruitful and multiply, not only to the people, but to the animals. Fill the earth. When you're ungodly, you do ungodly things. You promote ungodly things. And then you call it, we're helping to save the planet. They're not saving the planet. They're destroying the planet. What's going to happen is, we're going to start seeing things like this. For their own doing. What does the Bible say in Revelation? We'll get there. But what happens to a third of the food? A third of the animals? What happens to the third of the water? What happens to a third of the fish? Let's continue. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for every Egyptian sold his field. Because the famine was severe upon them, thus the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he removed them to the cities from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had an allotment from Pharaoh, and they lived off the allotment which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Behold, I have today bought you and your land for Pharaoh. Now here is seed for you, and you may sow the land. At the harvest you shall give a fifth to Pharaoh, and four-fifths shall be your own for seed of the field, and for your food, and for those of your households, and as food for your little ones. So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's slaves. Joseph made it a statute concerning the land of Egypt, valid to this day, that Pharaoh should have the fifth. Only the land of the priest did not become Pharaoh's. The severity was so great that they lost everything and even became slaves to Pharaoh. We don't know what that is, but it's coming. The Bible talks about an antichrist or a beast and a false prophet. It's coming. They couldn't even stay on the lands. They were forced to move to the cities. Remember we just read, thus the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he removed them to the cities from one end of Egypt's border to the other. Now, we don't understand the depth of this as much as the Townsends and the Bundys do. Um, Heidi, could you just throw out there, you're what generation on the same land that you're on? You're number eight. So eight generations of Heidi's family has been on the land that she is on. The Townsends are the seventh. What does that mean? Heidi's children, should they succeed and, and keep going, will be the ninth generation on the same piece of property. I'll bet none of us here know what that is. But they do. Now think about this. These Egyptians, I'm sure, like anybody else, they had this land from Pappy and Grandpappy and Great Grandpappy and all the way down. This was their family's land. It was so severe, they lost their land. It was so severe that they went from being free to being now slaves of the state. I said that on purpose. To the point where those same lands, Heidi, how devastated would you be if you experienced something like this and you were told you've got to move and you've got to live in the city of Lebanon, in the city, your land, you can't live there anymore, you've got to move. How devastated would that be? It'd be awful. It'd be repulsive. They took my land. I gave, or I sold my land because I was dying. I was, I was going to die. Now I can't even live there. I grew up there. How many memories? Generations of memories in that home. Generations of, you guys get it, we don't. I can't even imagine. Back in Genesis 41, 29, Joseph tells Pharaoh that seven years of great abundance are coming, then seven years of great famine are on its way. And in verse 34, one-fifth of the abundance came from everyone to store up for the world. In verse 49, Joseph stopped measuring the rations because it was beyond measure. Now, why do I bring this up? Great question. Let's look at it to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Verse 40 of 29 in chapter 41. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt. And after them, seven years of famine will come. And all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine will ravage the land. So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of that subsequent famine, for it will be very severe. Let Pharaoh take action to appoint overseers in charge of the land and let him exact a fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Let the food become as reserved for the land for the seven years of famine which will occur in the land of Egypt so that the land will not perish during the famine. 
Then Joseph stored up grain in a great abundance like the sand of the sea until he stopped measuring it, for it was beyond measure. I got some questions. And they apply to us. The Egyptians must have known about the coming famine as they were being taxed to prepare. Why didn't they save and prepare for themselves so as to avoid having to get into their predicament? In other words, if the abundance was so great that they were able to take one-fifth of everything that they had, and that was their tax, right, to, to help them during the land. It wasn't theirs because why? They had to sell everything to buy the stuff that were taxed of them to give to Pharaoh for the famine. It wasn't theirs. Amen? Is everybody with me on that? They, there was a tax thing. That was Pharaoh's. It all belonged to Pharaoh's. All of the produce, all the extra was not their food. So my question was, if there was such a great abundance where they stopped counting the food, they stopped even measuring it because it was so great, then why, if they had knowledge, and I'm assuming that they did because all of a sudden Joseph is being ridden through Egypt and he's being uh, proclaimed as a second in command, they had to have known that this was coming. Why didn't they prepare? I can understand the people of Canaan. I can understand Joseph's family. They had no idea. Joseph had to declare it to them in the famine. So they didn't do anything during the seven years of plenty. But in the famine, he made that declaration. The second year in, there's still five years left, he said. Why didn't the Egyptians save? I'll tell you why. Same reason we don't. Because we ignore the fact that there's a reality of Jesus saying there's a famine coming to the world. There is trouble coming to the world. What do we do? We do the same thing the Egyptians do. We just live on our paycheck to paycheck every single week. We don't save up. Because, you know, especially in our day and age, and I'm going to be a little funky here, in our day and age, it's illegal, it's unchristian to have money in the savings bank. Oh, what a sinner. You know what the Bible says? It's more of a sin to have surety, indebtedness, than it is to have savings. The Bible encourages us to save for famines, to save for things. There's nothing wrong with that. But the Bible does make a declaration, don't go into debt. But what do we do? Same thing. Why? Because you know what? Hey, that famine is a long way off. That declaration that Jesus made about the last days is so far off. Man, I'm 57 years old, almost 58 years old. They've been talking about this all my life. That's so far off. i got plenty of time to do whatever I want, anytime I want, however I want. We're no different than they are. Hopefully after today's message, we will be. Could it be possible... If Joseph couldn't measure the abundance that each household could have saved for the impending famine, could it be possible that they could have done the same thing, saved a little bit from the excess? I wonder what would have happened if the Egyptians heeded the warning given by Joseph. I bet they'd still have their land. Why? They would have saved up, stored up, See, sometimes we misappropriate Scripture, don't we? Don't we love that Scripture in the Gospels? You know, there was a man, Jesus said, that he had lots of goods. And he said to himself, self, he says, I have lots of good for years and years to come. You know what I'll do? I'm going to build new barns, big barns, and I'm going to store all that stuff for myself. And then the, what does the Bible say? Jesus says of this man, he says, you fool, today you, your soul is required of you. Well, I get that. But notice that it says he was saving it for himself. He wasn't sharing for anything. I want to put in your mind that it is not ungodly or sinful to be rich. I can say that because I'm not rich. <laughs> Nowhere in Scripture does it say it's ungodly or sinful to be rich or wealthy or have wealth set aside for, bit, for difficult times or to give it away. Nowhere. Well, wait, Jesus said that it's easier for a rich man to enter the eye of a needle or a camel to enter the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. But don't forget there's more to that story. Oh, Lord, who can be saved? Jesus said, with men it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. So that means if you're wealthy and you have some money set aside for famines, for whatever, you're helping the poor, whatever, and it's not something that you're idolizing, because remember, it's not the money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Amen? 
Hallelujah. Can I tell you we need to prepare? Famine is coming. What about our generation? Malachi 4, 5 and 6. Behold, I am sending to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Can I tell you, our land has been smitten with a curse. Why? Because fatherlessness is so prevalent in this country, it's not even funny. And kids do not respect their fathers any longer. And so God says, if these things don't take place, I'm going to smite the land with a curse. Folks, it's there. God showed us. He loves us so much, he prepares us for these things. Jesus answered and said to them, Matthew 24, 4 4 through 6, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I'm the Messiah, and they will mislead many people. And you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for those things must take place. But that's not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Can I tell you, that's been in the Bible for thousands of years. What about our generation? Are we prepared or are we preparing? The first thing we need to be prepared for is our soul. Are you right with God? Because sometimes we misjudge or think that God is just not, you know, he's, he's not paying any attention because we're not seeing his hand in marvelous things. We're not seeing the dead rays. We're not seeing lightning striking a lie. Although I was watching something uh, the other day where there was this pastor that was in this church that was saying blasphemous, wicked things about God. Lightning struck his church. It burnt to the ground. Yo, baby. Anyway, sometimes we think God is like, you know, way out there, not paying any attention, not listening to our cries, just because we don't hear anything, just because we don't feel anything, God's not listening. Yeah, he is. God takes note of everything. His patience sometimes is misunderstood for his, what we call his undecisive or inaction. Oops. That wasn't supposed to stop there. Maybe it was. Well, I'm not done. Anyway. When COVID hit, I'm going to share a testimony. When COVID hit, It's the time when I became your pastor. You all know this. A few months into uh, the summer, God spoke to my wife and I. You all know I had a nice Harley Davidson. We felt like it was time to sell it, pay off our house because it was the only debt that we had left. Get out of debt, stay out of debt. What you don't know is that not here, but with my wife's income, our income has gone like this. And right now our income's like this. But here's what I got to tell you. We don't have any debt to anyone anymore. We can still eat if we want to. I have clothes without holes, although I'm not dressed up with a tie today because we're doing the cookout. I have clothes without holes. Why? Because we can now afford clothes when we need clothes without having to worry about using the MasterCard or Visa. The Lord has allowed us to have savings in the bank for a rainy day. Well, as all of you know, my truck has experienced thunder showers and hurricanes. <laughs> I have put almost $7,000 into that truck, not one loan. Why am I saying this? Because some of us are so bound and choked by debt, we don't know what it is to be free. We can be free. Here's what we can do. If you have to, 
Have a yard sale. Sell everything. Sell everything that doesn't move. We're at a place now that if things get a little rougher as far as things are going, my dog's gone because we can't afford to have a dog. My motorcycle's gone. I don't care. We don't owe anybody anything. And I'm not married to anything except that woman right over there and my love for Jesus. That's all I got. Amen. Hallelujah. You know how free that is? That's so free that I can still be your pastor without having to have two and three jobs. But here, listen very carefully. Amos 8.11 says, There is a famine that's coming. Not a famine of bread and water, although that might hit us as well because Jesus talks about general famines. But he said, a famine of hearing the word of God. Now, I can't speak about any other church because I've been coming to this church for 10 years. I've been your pastor for three. I can't tell you about any other church or any other pastor. I have not sat under their teaching. Although I have seen some things on uh, little Facebook clips, little videos on YouTubes. And, and uh, you know, I'm kind of glad that I'm here. What's my point? My point is, there are some churches that the Word of God is silent and that's concerning to me. Jesus said false teachers and false prophets will arise in the last days to deceive many. There will be people in the church that will leave a church that is preaching the Word of God because the Bible says they will desire to have itching ears tickled by those who will, because you know what happens, the biggest part of our life with Christ is Repentance or justification. So in other words, if we're sinning, we need to repent. We're not supposed to justify our sin based on something else. As an example, let's just use this as one example. I think it's a powerful example. Because I've heard it said to me before. Not anybody here. David. King David. Never mind Solomon, but King David. You know how many wives he had? David had at least like nine wives. And he had ten concubines at least that were obliterated, if I could say it that way, by his son Absalom. It says 19 women that he had in his marriage stuff. You commit adultery. First thing you do. If you're in the justification line. Well, you know, God can't blame me. I only got one wife. King David had a whole bunch of them. I can go ahead and commit adultery because if God's not going to judge David, he's not going to judge me. Wrong. Wrong. As a people of God, the last thing that we're supposed to do in these last days in particular is justify sin. We're supposed to repent of it. What is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, or 1 Corinthians chapter 6, last part of the chapter? Be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God with your bodies. I want to see God absolutely have his way in the upper valley in a good way, where people are saying, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. But I got to tell you, we got to be ready here to be repentive if we need to be repentive. And then we need to take Amos 8.11 to heart and let's not be the one who God says of us that we were bringing a famine to the land because we were not communicating the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Some of you are all thinking, shut up and let's go to the cookout. This is heavy enough. I'm really believing that the close, according to the scriptures, and we'll go through this as detailed as I can, according to the scriptures, when Jesus sets his feet on Zion, it's going to be because of difficulty. He's not coming in a happy time. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he's going to come and defend Israel and the death that's going to take place at just the word of his mouth, the blood from those that die will come up to the bridle of the horse's mouth. 
for miles. That's coming at a bad time. Can I tell you when the Antichrist is going to rise or the, fall, the beast and the false prophet? You know when he's going to rise into power? When the whole world is in the place of Egypt and everybody's crying out for a savior. What does that mean? That means it doesn't get better, it gets worse. When the beast, the Antichrist, rise up into power, there's a seven-year period. The beginning of that seven years is when Israel signs a peace treaty with Ishmael. When that takes place, and in seven years, the first three and a half years are going to be absolutely amazing. Why? Because the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, they're going to rise up and they're going to convince the entire world that they're Jesus. They're going to see miracles come from this beast and false prophet. They're going to think he's Jesus. And so for three and a half years, he's going to convince the world that he's the savior of it. And in those three and a half years, he is going to declare unity, peace in the whole world. And how that peace and unity comes, are you ready? And it's not the COVID shot, but it's the 666. It's you cannot buy, sell, or trade without the 666 mark of the beast. The 666 mark of the beast. On the right hand or on the forehead, and no, the COVID shot was not. Because I saw people get it in the left arm. But think about it, though. Think of how the world reacted with COVID. A dangerous thing, taking lives. People responded. There were things that happened all around this world that we're going to go through. And it's not about COVID. I believe it's about the preparation of the beast and the false prophet. And I don't know about you, I want to be prepared. Not only that, but I want to make sure that the people that I love, I communicate correctly that time is short. You need to come to Jesus. You need to come to Jesus. Somebody that's blind is missing this stuff. I'm hoping that you're not blind. You got to come to Jesus. Every head up, every eye looking, I'm asking you this morning. I'm praying this morning. Those of you that are by Facebook, those of you that are on, uh, watching us on uh, YouTube or will watch us on YouTube tomorrow, here's the thing. I'm asking you, I'm begging you this morning. Don't take my word for it. If you have a Bible at home, read it. Read it. Pray. Ask the Lord to open your heart to understand some of the things that you may not understand. Read your Bibles. We're coming to the end times. We are in the end times. If you watch any preaching on TV or anywhere else, there are a multitude of preachers, a multitude of pastors that are saying, we're living in the end times. You've got to prepare. You've got to repent. You've got to be ready. Jesus could come at any time. And listen, I don't know this to be true, and I'm not making a date, but wouldn't it be cool if the Feast of Trumpets, which comes in the fall, if Jesus comes there at that time? Why? First Thessalonians chapter 4, and there will be a shout from the archangel, and there will be a trumpet blast. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that be cool? It could be this year, next year, whatever. But man, he's coming. Dead in Christ rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you're here this morning, if you're here this morning, take this as an opportunity. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Some of you are like, can you elaborate a little bit? I will for a few minutes, and then I'm going to close this, and I'm going to have you come talk to me afterwards if you'd like. But here's the thing. Jesus can't be looked at as your scapegoat from bad things. How many of you as Christians have experienced bad things as a Christian? Yeah, Jesus is not your scapegoat for bad things. Here's what Jesus is. Jesus is the one who paid the penalty that you and I deserve to pay because the Bible says that before we become Christians, the wrath of God is upon us. Why? Because we have broken his laws. He sees us as criminals. Jesus came to pay that price, to pay that. We can't pay it. There's no monetary exchange in heaven when we stand before God on Judgment Day. So Jesus paid that 2,000 years ago on the cross. And here's the cool thing. We have this thing called a blessed hope. My hope isn't in anything down here. I don't put my hope in the government. I'm not putting my hope in the next election. 
As a matter of fact, I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't care. Because Jesus is on the throne. He's not getting elected. He's not getting dethroned. He's on the throne, and that's where he stays. My blessed hope is that one day I'm going to see him in the next life. If you're here this morning, you've never invited Jesus to come into your life, to take control of it, to be your Lord, to be your Savior. If you've never asked him or thanked him for paying for your sin, today's the day. Come see me before you leave. I would love to pray with you. If you have any questions, I want to talk to you. I know we get a cookout. That's kind of a heavy message for a cookout, huh? Yeah, sorry about that. But you know what? I'd rather you eat the stuff off the grill than end up in the grill that God's got. Uh, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> My encouragement is if you want to talk to me about Jesus, please see me before you walk out of the sanctuary. Facebook. YouTube, please, don't delay, don't wait. Cry out to Christ. Ask Him to forgive your sins. Repent, turn away from your sins. Start reading your Bible. Let God's Word dictate your life as opposed to you trying to dictate it on your own. Because if you're like me, I was a terrible dictator of my life. I need Jesus to dictate and direct my life every step of the way. And let us know. Send us a Facebook post. Send us a call, 603 603- Four four eight three 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 three. Let us know if you've accepted Christ. We will rejoice with you. We will be excited about that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And again, I, I, we have never experienced a famine like what they experienced back in the days of Joseph. We just don't know what that's like. And there were subsequent famines throughout the scriptures in the days of Israel, the days of Judah where they were so bad that the women were eating their own children, the Bible says. The famines were so great. I don't know what that is. I don't want to know what that is. But it happened. And so, Father, I pray for the two famines, one that's now and one that's coming. The famine of your word not being proclaimed. Lord, I ask you, cause us to be little proclaimers of your word. Accuracy in your word, making proclamation. Help us not to be the ones that you say, you brought the famine in the land, you didn't communicate my word. And then, Lord, whatever famine comes, but it's a famine of food as it's been declared by our own president of our own country, whatever that kind of famine is, And Lord, I pray as Christians, that last song we sang, here in your presence, here in your presence, Lord, may we cling to Jesus. May we cling to your presence. May we have you now, not wait for then. Help us, oh God, help us to to get close to you. And Lord, there may be some of us, Lord, where we, we we gotta save up for the difficulty that could be coming uh, prior to your calling us home. Uh, Lord, help us, help us to follow what your Bible says. Help us to get out of debt. Help us, to, help us to save some money. Help us to help others, Lord God. That's the purpose of it. So, Lord Jesus, I, I just pray for us, Lord God, that we would just surrender to you, Lord. Everything that we are, everything that we have, help us to bask in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.